you know, these people went to Yale and Harvard. A lot of them didn't even know what lunch meat was. And I remember them saying, what is that? What is lunch meat? And I say, it's that square meat that's pressed. They'd be like, Well, uh, the first time I got uh, a laugh from an audience, I was totally hooked and had to continue. And I was three years old when that happened. And uh, I always wanted to be a comedian after that and loved comedians and loved getting the laugh. Yeah, the first time I got on stage, it was uh, 1980. And, um, you know, over the next four years, I just kept uh, honing and trying and, you know, fitting the act uh, for a broad audience, which I had to go to a lot of different venues because I didn't want to just have, you know, a limited audience. And uh, I just kept working it. And when I found that it worked anywhere in any kind of a venue, then I knew I was ready for the next step, which was to go to Los Angeles. Well, my first. Uh, Time on stage, I did five minutes for Mitzi Shore at the Comedy Store on Sunset Boulevard. And uh, that night, she um, took me into the main room and uh, told me to do 20. And that very night, uh, somebody from George Slaughter's office was in the audience, and he was doing a show called Funny about women. And so I was cast in that show the very night that I first stepped foot on stage in Los Angeles. And during rehearsal of that show, The Tonight Show, came and put me on. So it was like, wow, it was instantaneous. Uh, my first time on The Tonight Show, that was just a dream come true. And um, it went almost exactly the way I hoped and dreamed it would. It was just a life-changing, um, exciting, fantastic night. And the next day, after one Tonight Show appearance, I had uh, I had been on the show with Julio Iglesias, and he offered me uh, an 18-week tour to open for him. And so that was another, like, wow. It was just all within just a matter of months, and I had a television show, too. Tour, a, t a, t a, a primetime special, funny, The Tonight Show, and uh, a tour, and then a sitcom. It happened very quickly. I think my third time on the show, he... Uh, he was very, very kind and kind of guaranteed that um, he was going to, he said, you're going to be the most successful woman ever in stand-up comedy, and I give you my personal guarantee for that. He asked me, do you write your own material? And I said, yeah. And he said, well, it's very good, and uh, you're, I'm telling you, you're going to be the biggest woman ever in stand-up comedy, and you have my personal guarantee for that. So I was like, duh. I was a a gog. It was unbelievable. I, I was blazing a well-worn trail is how I would prefer to say it because I had uh, a lot of great women comics before me, Joan Rivers, Tody Fields, Phyllis Diller, Lily Tomlin, um, you know, and others, Mae West, uh, uh, Martha Ray, a lot of uh, many that I, I loved and uh, a lot of men too that I felt were my you know, four fathers or whatever, Lenny Bruce and George Carlin and uh, Dick Gregory and stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that that trail was, was laid there, but I, I kicked it a little bit. I kicked it as far as I could to the left, to move the center left. And uh, so in that way I say it, I, I was a trailblazer too. I made the trail wider. I wanted to make feminism and, uh, and women's issues just straight down the road, middle of the road. And they hadn't been until then. They had been very marginalized. And I kicked that open so that, you know, uh, it would be the normalization of uh, feminism in media. And uh, I saw the evidence of that immediately. And, and it was always exciting to me. And it still is exciting to me, too. I saw the commercials change in the point of view of females in the commercials change and I saw a lot of different women characters changing on TV and becoming more of themselves more of a centered feminist and female point of view rather than just the awestruck bystander 
as I call it. So, you know, I, I did what I came to do. I, I accomplished everything that I wanted to accomplish with my comedy. I wanted to tear down some walls and make some roads bigger and move the center left, and I did. I love Norman Lear, and I just, I think of him as my TV dad, you know, my media dad, and uh, he just was not, um, he was busy and not, uh, you know, able to to uh, do it, that kind of a show at that time, but, you know, um, you know, I, I love him, and, uh, and Carsey Warner w were doing the Cosby show, so they were like in the top slot, and I, I was lucky, lucky to get a meeting with them and then lucky to get their interest. No, I had no doubts that I was the author of the character and in fact the author of, of the concept and, and the context and, and uh, everything having to do with that show. It came from here and, uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't want to turn it over to anybody who had no idea what it was about and see them do what they tried to do. I just wouldn't let them do it and it was hard. It was really hard, and sometimes when I'm in a quiet space, I'll, I'll really uh, look back and think about what well, a lot of people who did, who went through stuff I, I went through, they didn't live. A lot of people in entertainment who tried to keep uh, control of the things they offer, they authored in their own, their own projects and their own vision. You know, it's just too hard, and and uh, you know I, I. Uh, you know, had a lot of, uh, had a lot of uh, stuff I could draw on, personal strength and stuff, but I wouldn't want to do it again. It was very difficult on my whole family. No, he, he wasn't an obstacle. He was, he, uh, he and I, um, you know, we met and, and we discussed and we, we worked together and, uh, you know, we hung out. I think he did uh, as good a job as he could do. I think he put his whole everything into it, you know. Um, but it it wasn't. It was uh, mm, when I saw it. It was like there were some good parts. There were some real good parts, and there were some other parts that weren't good. You know, I, I didn't like hate it wholesale. There, there was a lot of good in it. A lot of a lot of good scenes and and meat but a lot of bad kind of stuff that I just, so, you know, I just started to uh, bring it to his attention and, and do some of the writing myself because I was the one that was the comic. So I, I wrote quite a bit of that pilot, the second draft myself, and, you know, everybody who was there has seen the difference. But, um, you know, he wasn't like, an untalented person at all. Well, my acting improved because I was around such great actors, you know, and I, I never had really acted s too much other than playing King Ahasuerus in my synagogue uh, story of Purim when I was six, which was good for a girl because I played the king. I was a drag actress very early, but uh, yeah, you know, I, I was still a comic and like I say, being around great actors, and I was around great, not just good, but great actors, and of course it, a little bit of it rubbed off on me after a while. I think the pilot is like, you know, the pilot itself is a fantastic episode of television, and especially for its time, because it was like, what? Everybody was like, what? And uh, I'm really proud of that and the work I, I did on the pilot. And I think the first season was fantastic. We were really kicking them out of the park the first season. And, uh, you know, people liked it a lot. Uh, first few seasons, about the first three, it was like no, no misses, almost no misses. It was fantastic. The thing that was different about the show was that it dealt with class in America, class issues, and um, women in class, and uh, and women in, in their families and working class families. None of that was ever on TV before, really, for the most part, with a woman's point of view wrapped around it. 
Yeah, I was cognizant of that from the beginning, and it's what I, in fact, in, intended to do when I used to watch all those uh, television shows and sitcoms myself in my home and just go, you've got to be, and I don't want to swear, but you've got to be shitting me with this crap. And it made me angry. And I'd, be, I'd think, well, if I ever was on TV, I'd F and this and that and the other. And because uh, that's how I talk at home. <laughs> but uh, no, I mean, you know, I kind of got obsessed with it. And like, I'm, I, I got obsessed with TV and media and seeing and doing something new because it was, I just, thought it, I, I just saw that it was possible. I also saw, saw and respected uh, what a great medium television is for. You know, being the medium between an artist and the and the and the audience is just a great. It's a great form, a venue, and I loved it because once again, you know, you were you were taking uh, radical concepts and bringing them to the middle of the road audience, and that, that's what I think my my talent's always been, and I can say radical things in a in a down to earth way, and. Uh, and that was fun. Uh, crafting the message was a blast. Um, well, you know, after all is said and done, I, I, uh, I have to say stand up because, you know, I don't have to work with anybody. And it's just me. It's what I want to say. It's timed exactly the way I want to say it, perform the way I want to do it for as long as I want to do it. If I want to stop and talk to an audience member, you know, I can do it. I, I, I just, it's like, Stand-up is, there's nothing better than stand-up because you're in total control of your product and your everything. It's just, and plus not a lot of people can do it. So that, that's what's also very exciting about it. Well, you know, like musicians don't stop playing music once they get a, have a successful record. And we have chops. We have to keep our chops up. We, we, you know, you can't let them go because they do go. There was about 10 years where I didn't do stand-up, and man, I had to relearn it. it. It wasn't like riding a bike, like I thought. I mean, all that timing and all, all of that uh, stuff that you do when you do stand-up, editing in the moment and all that stuff, and being outside yourself to watch yourself, and also being like part of the audience to watch yourself, all, all the things that uh, come with that medium, um, it was just, it could get rusty, so I, I never will. I never will stop working because I, I want to stay on top of my own chops. You know, I told you that phone yeah, would go off. Yeah, you're 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 working on a you're cooking on about four burners, is how I've said it before. You're cooking on all four burners. You're seeing them see you, and you're seeing yourself as they as you uh, figure they're seeing you how they're going to take your the joke, how you're going to time the joke for that specific audience because it's different every night. You, you don't tell the same joke exactly the same way. If you've got an older crowd and they're more quiet, you tell the joke a different way. Um, you know, it's different every night and there are just levels. There's 30, 30 or more levels to it. Um, people that I respect, I, I remember as a kid hearing them say, it takes 30 years to make a good, a great stand-up comic. And it does. It's a lot. There's so much stuff going on. You, like, you know, you see people driving race cars and you think, oh, they get in, turn on the thing and step on that gas. There's a lot of layers to it that you learn. And it's really fun to do that and, you know, to be inside your brain when it's working like that. You really, you really feel very alive. Yeah, I, I always had a, a live audience. Um, and always loved it because, you know, like I'm a comic, so I like an audience and people laughing, you know. It's just a great feeling for a comic. So um, I always liked the audience and uh, always wanted them. Well, you want, you're, you like them because it give, it like energizes you to go, well, they're going to love this, you know, and it's like, boom, you know, you're giving them a gift. And they give you a gift back by laughing at it, you know. So it's like you want to give. It, it's like a really, uh, it's a cool give and take thing, an exchange of energy. It's very cosmic, actually, I always thought. Well, yeah, I did. I feel like I did reach the pinnacle of my profession. I won a Peabody. And, uh, you know, that's 
very cool. That's, that's really, really cool. And uh, yeah, I did uh, knock the number one show, the Cosby Show, out of first place um, almost immediately. But you know, it had been on for a while because that was a really revolutionary show too. Uh, and I love Bill Cosby and I love that show, but you know, it had been on for a while. If I, I wouldn't have been able to do that, I think in his second season, you know, he, he was so strong and that show was so strong. But, you know, it was just the timing was right. And people who had loved that show, and it, it was always about, you know, wearing $4,000 sweaters, they were ready for, uh, you know, somebody who's fat and wears a denim shirt. I was like actually the first grunge person. And uh, I remember they kind of credited me with that grunge grunge artists or punk rockers and stuff because we, we put on those plaid shirts and all that stuff on TV um, a, a long time ago. But that was a working class thing. But, you know, it was fun. Well, television's all about turning stereotypes upside down. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, the, the people who work on television, what they think turning a stereotype upside down is is often the opposite of turning a stereotype upside down, which was why it was fun and hard for me because I would make them flip it one more time. And I would tell them that too. Let's flip it one more time. You've only flipped it about once, but it needs to be flipped three times in order to like do what I want to do. It's all about point of view. And uh, you know, when, when you have largely male writers, you know, they, they, don't, they didn't understand then, although they seem to now. And a lot of that's because they worked with me. But uh, you know, they, they thought that, uh, that uh, saying something feminist or you know, something pro-woman was the opposite of saying something pro-man, and it isn't. It isn't at all. In fact, it's almost the opposite. I mean, it's almost the opposite of the opposite. So, um, you know, I would always make sure to uh, make that point. The male writer, Matt, and it wasn't just Matt, it was Matt and his, you know, cadre of, of writers that included one or two uh, women. Um, but, uh, you know, they did that. They, they wrote my they wrote my speech as being like the opposite of a big male pig, like a big sexist male pig. They flipped it so that I was a big sexist uh, male pretender pig. And, um, you know, they wanted me to say those lines. Where I was like, that isn't how people, that isn't how women talk. I don't even know any men that talk that way besides Archie Bunker. And it was like, I know you guys like, think that I'm like the girl Archie Bunker, but you know, I'm not. So it was like just pushing through and you know, these people went to Yale and Harvard. And a lot of them didn't even know what lunch meat was. And I remember them saying, what is that? What is lunch meat? And I say, it's that square meat that's pressed. They'd be like. So there was a lot of class issues like that. And uh, you know, it was, it was everything that's uh, offensive about America in a one small room <laughs> to me. Well, people do say that to me, and I, I get scared. So I'm like, huh? Uh, don't blame me for what you are. A lot of times it's like, what? But, um, you know, because people, uh, what people think of me is often not what I am. And uh, that's true for everybody, you know. But uh, the thing that's most uh, gratifying or touching, whatever, is a lot of people do come up to me and say, you, you were my mom. You raised me. And, you know, I have to say, I hear that almost every day for, what is it, 30 years now, 25 years? Sometimes multiple times a day. And that's... I like that one. Uh, I say, well, I gave birth to this generation, and now I must lead them. So that's why I kind of ran for president, was with that in mind. 
Well, my first experience was of watching um, comics on television on Ed Sullivan. That was with my dad. And my father wanted to be a stand-up comic himself. So he, like, made me be one. He made me into one. Um, and uh, we would, that was one of the few things that we ever did together was watch Ed Sullivan and my father would critique the comic. And, um, you know, he, he just had, he, he was a very funny man and he understood comedy like almost nobody else I've ever met since. But uh, he would break it down politically and tell me what it was and I, I was, uh, you know, at, at his knee learning and he, 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 uh, he said, this guy is funny because he says funny things. But this guy, he'd say, this guy's a comic because he says funny things. But this guy's a comedian because he says things funny. And then he would, like, tell me who, who was, like, a true, a true brave, you know, I can't remember the words he used, but, you know, he, he, he honored. Like, he had all Lenny Bruce's records, and we, we'd listen to Lenny Bruce, and my dad would tell me, Look at him fighting. Look at look at this freedom fighter. So I got trained like that. And uh, uh, the first time I saw Richard Pryor on uh, Ed Sullivan, it was like, oh my God! Like so many people, I, I wanted to do what he did, which was when I watched him, it was like, oh my God! He got right inside that stereotype and started punching his way out, punching the walls out not down and not in, but out. And I, I, I just really, um, I learned that, you know, from him. He had an elevated sense of justice and he had an elevated sense of his place in it for, for like being a leader and, and saying it first, everything that everybody was just starting to wonder about. People were, at that time, were, you know, he just got the whole, whatever it was, gestalt, the whole unconscious gestalt and he, brought it out and let everybody look right into it and it was a mirror that where they saw themselves you know he uh, he saw that uh, you know everybody was at that time starting to say this is kind of what is racism you know there had been, it'd been coming for a while what is it really and he just goes here's what it is you know and we were like ah! and we had to laugh because it's so true and then, and then it was like really confronting it with laughing it to scorn and that's the power of comedy and the genius of comedy and the wonder of this great art form of comedy. It's to laugh ridiculous things to scorn and laugh power to scorn. And that's what Richard Pryor did. Well, I did, I did think about going back to the sitcom form and I tried it, but you know, um, I, I might be too old now because I can't really, I'm not real good at comedy by committee. I was really impressed with Louis C.K. saying, you know what, I'm going to write all the jokes. I don't need a room full of writers. I'm going to write all the jokes, and if they don't work, I'll take all the blame because I, I don't, I don't want to run my jokes through 16 guys that went to Harvard and wore suits and tell me the business of humor because that's never going to be funny. And, you know, I was glad to hear him say that, and that's kind of the, exactly where it's at. I, I think about uh, um, returning, definitely, but, you know, I've written about eight other sitcoms since then, but something stops me at the end. It's like, I just, I, I might try it in another form, such as, uh, you know, a, a three-minute series on the internet where there isn't so much group. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not uh, into that so much. That's why I like stand up. I don't, I don't have to answer to anybody. Well, I mean, I do. Eventually, the club owner or whatever won't hire me back if I'm not funny or filling the seats. But I just want my own material. I don't want to have somebody that I go, oh, God, I hate this, and I have to make it funnier. I'd rather start at the top and bring it down. It's easier for me. We did try to do another series, me and John Goodman. John Goodman, uh, we, we hooked up again. But you know what? We just didn't do it right. I didn't do it right. And uh, I guess I got cold feet, like going, oh, my God, can I live through this again? Because I was in a big concrete box for 10 years with no windows. Every day for 10 years, day in and day out, 
in that, and I was like, get a little, uh-oh. What if it, what if it, what if it's a hit? Oh, no. Because I'm old, and I want to travel and do stuff, and I don't, I don't want to be in that box. I do have uh, a lot of inner strength, and it comes from my family, I guess. Uh, you know, my, my family went through a lot of hardships in, in Europe. Most of them didn't make it out alive. And uh, so, of course, that in, always informs everything for me, my culture, my Jewish culture, that, uh, no, you just, you don't, you don't ever collude. You don't ever go, okay, I'll be quiet and sit here. We didn't stay around for 6,000 years that way. And I guess, you know, that's kind of all the, all the women in my family were like that. Oh, no. Well, like my grandmother was 72 years old, and, um, you know, I saw her grab a six foot tall policeman by the shoulders and say, you listen, listen. And that, that's just how my family is, you know. So I had that. It wasn't really all that different because it was, you know, I, I just looked at it as, uh, you know, group effort and everybody's, you know, putting forth this whole production, this whole idea. Um, the working with the actors part was just a blast from beginning to end that was a fun that was the most fun part and uh, thinking of good lines for other actors was just part of being a stand-up comic and a writer too I liked working with writers although people will never believe that but I, I liked working with people who have fresh ideas and can uh, you know think out of the box and I, I found quite a few of them I uh, I discovered Joss Whedon and uh, and 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 uh, Judd Apatow and and uh, you know about 15 or 20 of people who wrote for my show now uh, have their own television shows. Chuck Lorre, a lot of people, and uh, you know I, I enjoy working with creative writers and coming up with creative ideas and watching creative actors, you know, make it real and happen. On, on so many different levels, it, it was gratifying. First three seasons, there were no misses. So you know, we kept, I kept, I kept trying to be brave and on top of it and on the cutting edge of things. And so there were some hits, and there were some hits and misses. But God, you know, uh, that that's part of not, that's part of staying on the air for nine years. Um, yeah, I'm proud of all of it. I'm really proud of a, a show which we called one of the lost episodes, and it was the 50s show. So um, if anybody is uh, out there and, and wants to see something that was within, something I did that was uh, a little bit different, although it stayed pretty much in form, I, I would uh, I'd suggest they take a look at the 50s show. I'm very, very proud of that one. That one's maybe the best show, uh, my favorite of the whole. It was just so different. It was uh, me. It was uh, kind of stating the difference between my show and every other sitcom before it. And also, uh, another show we did was uh, the mother show, where we had other TV moms come on, and uh, that one, now you know, I like that too. Um, one of the best ones that I liked the most for like breaking through things was where Darlene got her period. I wrote that with, you know, many people, but my sister and I. And uh, my sister and I also wrote the, uh, in the first or second, first season where Roseanne gets a writing room in the basement. And then my daughters um, helped me, along with April Winter and Alan Stephen at the end, write the, the uh, finale, which was where, you know, we find out that my character is, is has been a writer and was um, in that writing room writing the last three seasons. So there, there's a, there was a lot of story on stage and off.